Now, Mary is the temple. Of course, it's a very, very big uh, subject. And coming here, I thought the thing to do would be to focus on, for example, seal of Walsingham, um, the incarnation aspect of Mary, and other things that I have here. Are we having trouble with the microphone? I've got people waving their ears over the back. You can't hear. Right. Somebody's gone to have a go. Let's see if they can improve it as a children. Right, we try again. Is that any better? Yes, they say. Can people at the back actually hear? You can. Not well. Well, I haven't got any more voice than this. No, um, uh, oh, this is all going up into the arch. Yeah. Is that any better speaking here? Or should I come further forward again? Right, is that any better? Ah, there you are, you see. Right, go down lower. Um, I was waiting in that place. That is what makes this an illustrative lecture, you see. You haven't got the high tech you had last night. (laughs) I can walk confident with a magic marker. So, something about Mary and the temple. First of all, I need to introduce this temple plan here. Now, that is the theoretical shape of a temple. And it's an oblong, I can't judge it very well, it should be the equivalent of three three cubes, or three squares for the floor. And the important thing, the stage set, if you like, for all temple theology, is to remember that the temple represents the invisible and the visible creation. And despite all the efforts of creationists, in fact, Genesis chapter 1 is not about the six days of creation in any sense that they would ever have imagined. It corresponds to the six ceremonial stages of constructing the temple or the tabernacle. And the two stories were blended in together. So, going from left to right, where there is the figure one, that represents day one of the creation. And then two is the veil, that's the second day. And then the main part of the temple, the Hekal, the great hall, that represents the visible creation of days three, four, five, and six in Genesis. And the movement, if you like, in temple theology is passing between the visible creation, which is the great hall, the Hekal, through the veil into the Holy of Holies, and that represents the origin of creation, day one. Not Thursday. Despite most English translations, the Hebrew and the Greek make it quite clear it's day one or one day. Why? because it's outside a temporal sequence. You can have the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. But underlying all of them is day one. And that's outside time, it's beyond matter. And so it's a place where, because there's no time and no matter, there can be no division in our sense of the word. Think about it, what causes division in our temporal world is matter and time. So that's basic temporal worldview. Now, the second thing, as a preliminary, I have to tell you about an institution of scribes. This was an official institution in the second temple. That's the temple that was built about 520 BC through until the one destroyed by the Romans, although it was rebuilt by Herod and so forth, but broadly the Second Temple. And set up in the Second Temple period were a group of scribes in the temple who were officially called the Correcting Scribes, or 
the restoring scribes, depending on your point of view. And they were authorized to alter within certain rules the texts of the Hebrew scriptures. There were very strict rules. You could only change, you could have a metathesis of two letters, you could have substitute one letter for another one that sounded the same, or of course you could impose a different way of voicing those consonants. Um, nowadays we say repointing the consonants, but they didn't have pointing then, so a different way to read the words. And they were authorized to remove from the text anything that the temple authorities at the time thought was blasphemous, or that couldn't possibly be the right reading. Same have done, of course, in modern Bible translations. All sorts of things have disappeared because the translators thought it couldn't possibly mean that. So they took it upon themselves to change it. And this is one of the problems with a lot of our modern English versions, certainly. So you have the Guild of Correcting the Scribes, and their corrections are known as the Tikkune, the restorations, nice euphemism, the restorations of the scribes, the Tikkune Sobri. Now, bearing that in mind... I'm going to lead you through a little bit of the Mary material and show you how, because these texts were so sensitive after the Christians began using them, the scribes got to work. Very, very interesting. And we know for <coughs> one example, as sure as you can be, and of course all biblical scholarship is guesswork. It's informed guesswork, we hope, but it's all guesswork. And we can see in some places where just tweaking one letter, almost imperceptible, completely changes the meaning. And this is in Psalm 110, but we'll get there in the end. <clears throat> so, in the New Testament, Mary appears three times in the temple. When she and Joseph took the infant Jesus to the temple and met Simeon and Anna, when Jesus was a boy and became separated from Mary and Joseph when they were returning after Passover, and, this may surprise you, when St. John saw the woman clothed with the sun in the temple, Revelation chapter 12. God's temple in heaven was opened, the ark of his covenant was seen, and a great portent appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. She gave birth to a boy child and was taken, who was taken up to the throne of God. This was how the early Christians described Mary giving birth to her son. It was an event in heaven. Now, the lady in the temple has been identified in many ways, but she was originally the Holy Wisdom. The Holy Wisdom is perhaps a, a figure more familiar to the Eastern tradition of the Church, but she's there from the very beginning. And this is one of the many names for the Lady of the Jerusalem Temple. In the ancient faith of Jerusalem, that's in the time of the kings, so in the first temple, she had been the mother of the Anointed One, the mother of the Messiah, but she was banished when King Josiah purged the temple in 623. Now, King Josiah instigated something very like the Reformation in this country. He just went through and sort of chucked everything out. But what I'm going to show you now, I hope, is how the early Christians still knew about the lady in the temple and how they told the nativity story within that temple framework. Where these traditions survived would take a very long time to show you, so you'll have to believe me and I tell you they did. We're going to start with the infancy gospel of James, which has never been included in the New Testament, but despite that, it is the source of the details in the Annunciation icon and in the Nativity icon. So Mary spinning the red wool when Gabriel spoke to her, the birth in a cave, the midwife bathing the child, and so on. These are all from the infancy Gospel of James. It was probably written about 150. 
This gospel is attributed to James, the son of Joseph, by his first marriage, and it tells the story of Mary's birth and childhood. The earliest certain reference to material in this gospel might not have been written in the form that we now have it, but the material in this gospel, it's in the writings of Clement of Alexandria, who died in 215. And the story in this gospel is this. As a three-year-old child, Mary was given to the temple, just as the infant Samuel had been given to the temple, and she lived there, fed by an angel. This probably meant she was fed by a priest, since the temple priests were called angels. And at the age of 12, she left the temple, and the priests found Joseph, a widower, to be her guardian. She'd been trained as a temple weaver, and when a new veil was needed for the temple, Mary was one of the young women chosen to make it. And that is why the Annunciation <coughs> icon depicts her spinning red wool. There are many details in this gospel that are no longer clear to us, but those that can be recognised show that Mary was being described as the Lady Wisdom. Mary was placed in the temple as a child, and this is a reference to Wisdom's claim, in the holy tabernacle I ministered before him, and I was established in Zion. This is from Ben Sira, chapter 24. When the priest received her into the temple, she danced and everybody loved her. Now this apparently trivial detail was significant because it showed that Mary was wisdom as described in Proverbs chapter 8, the one who rejoiced before the Lord and delighted him. We shall return to this enigmatic poem in Proverbs, which describes wisdom beside the Creator while the world was being made, but she was also on earth. We shall come to that later. Later, according to the story, Mary helped to weave a new veil for the temple. Now, historically, this is not impossible because Herod began the major refurbishment of the temple in 20 BC, and Jesus was born in 7 or 6 BC. And this is why the infancy gospel of James tells the story of the Annunciation in two episodes. First, the angel called to her while she was by the well. Remember the well? And then, Mary was afraid and went home, and then while she was spinning, the angel spoke to her again. Why should Mary be weaving the veil while she was pregnant? And here, a little bit of temple background. I shall interject this occasionally so you could keep up with the story. The temple veil symbolized matter. It was woven from threads of white, blue, red, and purple. And these represented the four elements of earth, air, fire, and water. And this special fabric was used in two places in the temple. It was used as a veil to hide the glory of God from human eyes, so that's the second day, that squiggly line there. It was also used as the outer vestment of the high priest, which he wore when he was functioning in the visible creation. So when he's functioning out in the visible creation, he wears this four-colored vestment. But when he is within the Holy of Holies, he takes that off and he enters only wearing white linen, which is a sign that he is in the angel state. So beings beyond the veil are angelic. The high priest represented the presence of the Lord in the creation, in the outer part of the temple. That's why he wore the name on his forehead. In the center of his forehead, despite the pictures that you see of, of uh, several Hebrew letters on his forehead, what he would have worn on his forehead was just the four letters of the name, or sometimes just the diagonal cross, 
was marked on the forehead with a diagonal cross, and that was the sign of the name of the Lord. And of course, that's where our Christian signing comes from. It's been rotated 45 degrees, but it was originally that. So, um, <clears throat> the veil symbolized matter, and the high priest who represented the presence of the Lord, and when he was on earth, he was the Lord clothed in matter. Mary was weaving the new veil and thus the vestment for the great high priest. And here, of course, Charles Wesley's line, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity. <coughs> we all sing that at Christmas. How many people know what they're singing? It's very interesting to preach on that and watch the reaction. <coughs> now, according to the Gospel of James, Mary gave birth to Jesus in a cave. Joseph had left her there while he went to find a midwife. And as he walked, according to some manuscripts of the infancy gospel, as he walked, time stood still. Nothing moved. And then everything resumed its normal state. The timeless had entered time. And when Joseph returned with the midwife, and I'm quoting here from the Gospel of James, they stood by the cave and there was a bright cloud overshadowing it. The cloud withdrew from the cave and a light appeared there. Gradually the light diminished and the child appeared. End of quote. In the story, the cave had the role of the Holy of Holies and you will recall that the woman clothed with the sun was seen with the Ark of the Covenant. That is, she was in the Holy of Holies. And she gave birth in the Holy of Holies, and her son was enthroned there. Now, in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures, when the glory came into the Holy of Holies, there was a bright cloud overshadowing. There was the cloud and the glory that came to consecrate the tabernacle, Exodus 24, and there was the cloud, that's wrong, that should be Exodus 40. And the cloud and the glory that came when Solomon consecrated the temple, 1 Kings 8. Note that the cloud and the glory are distinct. In the story of the Exodus, the Lord travelled with his people in, not as, a pillar of cloud. He travelled in a pillar of cloud, there was also a pillar of fire. Now, the prophet Ezekiel described the bright cloud as the vehicle for the glory of the Lord. He saw the chariot throne within the bright cloud, and the glory of the Lord was on the throne. He saw the cloud and the glory leave the temple, and he saw them as they arrived in Babylon. The bright cloud enveloping the throne was well known. When Job described the creation, he said, he covers the presence of the throne and spreads over it his cloud. That's what the Hebrew actually says. You will find many different versions of that in English translations. Now, the bright cloud later became a title for Mary. But in the temple, it had been a title for wisdom. I quote, I dwelt in high places and my throne was in a pillar of cloud. Again, then Sira, chapter 24. It seems that the bright cloud had also been a symbol for the mother of the temple priests. And here I must say something about the very sophisticated literary convention that ca characterized a temple tradition, but alas, is completely lost in translation. Though temple writers, prophets, poets, used pairs of words that sounded similar but had very different meanings. And the point of their sayings was found in the two ways that the oracle or the poem could be read or heard. So, when the third Isaiah was condemning the corrupt priests of his time, this is in Isaiah 57, he said, you draw near, that's a term for approaching the Holy of Holies, Sons of a sorceress. That's a very odd thing to say. Now, draw near, technical term for making priestly offerings, but sorceress is written, the consonants are written, in the same way 
as the consonants for the bright cloud. But they are pronounced differently. Sorceress is pronounced onana, and the, cl- the cloud is pronounced <coughs> onana. Now, for this condemnation to have any point, the true priests must have been known as the sons of the bright cloud. Matthew who wrote the most Hebraic of the Gospels, perhaps because he was writing for Jews who had become Christians, described the transfiguration like this. A bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son. Why the cloud, and whose voice was it? At Jesus' baptism, there was also a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved son. Early <coughs> Christians understood this, to be the voice of Jesus' heavenly <coughs> The infancy gospel of James said time stood still as a bright cloud over the shadow of the cave when Jesus was born. A light appeared from which the child became visible. This is a theological statement pointing back to the enthronement rituals of the divine kings in Jerusalem. When St. John described the woman clothed with the sun, and her child born in the Holy of Holies, that timeless state, he was describing the same event. Now here I need to give you a little bit more temple background. First, they believed that an angel (coughs) or a heavenly being could have an earthly counterpart. Origen, the great Christian biblical scholar writing in the early 3rd century, had contacts with Jewish scholars when he was living in Caesarea. And he explained that John the Baptist was also an angel and cited Jewish texts to show that this was what the Jews believed. It seems that this belief was ancient because 1,000 years earlier, the Davidic king was believed to be simultaneously an earthly king and also the visible presence of the Lord. You will recall the title in Isaiah, Emmanuel, God with us. And that's not only the title given to the expected child, it's also, in Isaiah chapter 8, given to the current king. Now second, there are several psalms and passages which suggest that the crown prince was made king and the Lord by a birth ritual in the Holy of Holies. He was anointed and enthroned in the Holy of Holies, and after this, he was the Lord. He had many titles, according to Psalm 89, he shall cry to me, thou art my father, I will make him the firstborn. So he was called the firstborn. Psalm 2 is similar, the Lord said to me, you're my son, today I have begotten you. And so the king was the divine son, which simply meant the earthly counterpart of the Lord. The Lord was himself the son of God most high in the angel hierarchy, as we shall see. The perfumed anointing oil was called the sweet dew, fragrant like myrrh. This comes from a non-canonical text called Second Enoch. It was kept in the Holy of Holies, this anointing oil was kept in the Holy of Holies, and later tradition said it represented oil pressed from the fragrant tree of life. And of course the tree of life was also a symbol of wisdom. Thus the king was born, in inverted commas, by a sacrament of wisdom, and he became the divine son. To use an evangelical phrase, he was born again. He was then seated on the throne of the Lord, the great cherub throne in the Holy of Holies, and all the people worshipped him. 1 Chronicles 29. Now this was said of Solomon, but it was true of all the kings. But much of this is lost in the English translations, which have tried to clarify the text for modern readers, and have in the process lost the meaning. The people worship the Lord, says the Hebrew. And then the English goes on, and they did obeisance to the king, as though there were two distinct actions, worshipping the Lord and doing obeisance to the king. But the Hebrew says that they worshipped the Lord, the king. 
one action, one verb. But the English versions have thought that can't be right, and they felt it's a lot of it. And this happens time and time again. So third, there was the golden cherub throne in the Holy of Holies, but this was also a symbol of wisdom. And here too, the English translations have obscured the real meaning of the texts. Ezekiel came from a first temple priestly family. He described the throne as he knew it. In his vision, he saw the throne leaving the Holy of Holies, leaving the polluted temple. Now he has two accounts of this, in chapter 1 and in chapter 10, and the Hebrew in both these chapters is just about opaque. There are many rare or ambiguous words, and because we do not know what the text is about, it's not easy to make appropriate choices in the translation. What is clear, though, is that he saw a female living being, and this was the lady leaving the temple. <coughs> now, the English translations say that he saw living creatures, <coughs> plural, and the Jerusalem Bible even says he saw animals, plural. <coughs> now, the Hebrew has a mixture of singular and plural forms of this word chaya, which can mean an animal but it can also mean the living one. And in several places, one, two, three, four, five, six places in these two chapters, so the majority of instances, it's a singular form. And only the authorized version keeps the singular form and talks about the living creature. All the others make it a plural, and you have this picture of four rather strange animals leaving the temple. What Ezekiel actually saw was a female form whom he called the living one who could be honoured with the plural form of her name. Remember, God is a plural form in Hebrew, Elohim. This living one was surrounded by rings of light, that's wheels within wheels in plain English, uh, rings of light, and above her the Lord was enthroned, and they left the temple. Reading Ezekiel's vision in this way shows that the living one was a fiery being, woman clothed with the sun, sometimes described as fourfold, and her spirit was within the wheels, those circles of light. This fiery living one was the woman John described as the woman clothed with the sun who gave birth to her boy child. He was snatched up to the throne. Now, we now return to the king-making ritual in the first temple, Psalm 110. And it begins, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. And then it goes on to say, from the womb of the morning, like dew, your youth will come to you. Well, that's hardly a translation, but it's the words we've got there. <clears throat> now, the text is confused. Those words are not really a translation at all. Mm -hmm but only a guess as to what the Hebrew might have meant. If scholars are accurate, you'd have a row of asterisks for verse 3 of that song. But you can't have a row of asterisks in the choir kind of humming at even song. So you have to go Now, you may recall, I said the correcting scribes did their work. And this is one example. Texts that became important to Christians were altered or removed about 100 CE in the final phase of their work. The Hebrew scriptures that we now have are not the text that Jesus knew, as the Dead Sea Scrolls have shown. That's not important guesswork, that's fact. No text of this particular psalm has been found among the scrolls, but the Greek translation of this psalm, made before the time of Jesus, gives some idea of the original. Instead of your youth, it has I have begotten you. The son, the king is born, I have begotten you, which is a perfectly possible way to read the Hebrew letters. But by pronouncing the word differently, it was possible to make a dramatic change in the meaning, as we've seen with the sorceress and the bright cloud. What has disappeared from this verse is the idea of the birth as the divine son. Now, the Holy of Holies has also disappeared. 
Where the authorized version has in the beauties of holiness, and the RSV has upon the holy mountains, the Greek has in the glory of the holy ones. This took place among the angels in the holy of holies. Now, without giving you all the details of how the Hebrew became corrupted, but it's all done within the rules of the correcting scribes, the original of this verse was probably, on the day of your birth in the glory of the holy ones, I've begotten you with dew from the womb as the morning star. Now, morning star was a title for Jesus, the book of Revelation, I've I, Jesus, have sent my angel to you. I am the root and offspring of David, the bright morning star. So we know the book of Revelation is about this holy of holies experience. But what of this word womb? I have begotten you with dew from the womb. Now there was a mother goddess in the neighboring state whose name was written with the same letters, pronounced Rachmai, she was a goddess at Ugarit, and there may have been a similar lady in Jerusalem. This lady was the sun goddess, and she was the heavenly mother of the crown prince who was called the morning star. And this is the woman that John saw clothed with the sun, giving birth to the morning star just before the great day of judgment. Malachi had prophesied that when the Lord came on the day of judgment, Elijah would come first, and then also the true son. Normal translation, the son of righteousness, that's S-U-N, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in her wings. The Hebrew is quite clear, her wings. The English versions say his wings or its wings, because what they had before them couldn't possibly have been right. The Hebrew word for son could be either masculine or feminine. And here, the Hebrew form chosen is feminine, presumably for a reason. Malachi prophesied the return of the woman clothed with the sun. And what the Hebrew actually says was not considered by our own version of the correct scribes, who were quite certain that the text couldn't possibly mean what it actually said. Now, the early Christians read the whole of Psalm 110 as a prophecy of Jesus. But they read the word womb as the word Miriam, in other words, Mary, the Hebrew form of the name. What they read was, I have begotten you with dew from Miriam as the morning star. And in Hebrew, this means changing only one letter. And in the archaic Hebrew script that was still used for sacred texts in the time of Jesus, those two letters look very similar. All you have to do is to draw the archaic yud, which is like an F falling over, and you put another stroke to it. And you immediately change the whole meaning of the psalm. So, born from the womb, well, that's a kind of normal process, but born from Mary is really rather interesting. And that's how, this is from you see, this is commentary on the psalms. So the next question has to be, why was the heavenly mother of the Davidic king called Miriam? And here I'm going to draw on some Jewish traditions, especially their great commentary on Exodus, known as the Exodus Rabbah, the great Exodus. Miriam was remembered as the great lady of Israel's history. She and her two brothers, Moses and Aaron, were ancestors of the three great institutions. Aaron was the high priest, Moses was the king, which is curious, but that's how he was described in the time of Jesus. And Miriam was wisdom. Miriam, the older sister, protected her people in their wilderness wandering <coughs> by a miraculous well, which moved with them and gave them water. You remember where Mary's first annunciation was? By the well. Now, how old are these ideas? There are hints of them, even in the Hebrew scriptures. According to the book of Numbers, Miriam died before the people reached Canaan, and there was no more water for the people. What an odd thing to say. Miriam died, and there was no more water. In the infancy gospel of James, Mary's first encounter with the angel is by the well. Miriam was also remembered as the mother of Bezalel, who was filled with the spirit of God and wisdom to build the tabernacle. 
She was also the remote ancestor of King David. So she was the mother of the royal house in both senses of the word. She was the mother of the temple. She was the mother of the Davidic dynasty. It's possible, you can say no more, that the early Christians who read Psalm 110 as a prophecy of Mary had remembered the psalm's original meaning. If their Jewish contemporaries knew that Miriam was the mother of the Davidic kings, then the psalm that described how the king was born in the Holy of Holies could well have named Miriam or Wisdom as his mother. The crown prince had become a king in the Holy of Holies. He was begotten with dew as the morning star, and his mother was Miriam. Now the correcting scribes may have changed the name to womb, and the first Christians could have kept the original sense. We don't know, this is the informed guesswork. The Christmas story, as it's told in the Quran, may also remember this change. The story in the Quran is a shortened form of the infancy gospel of James, with Mary brought, in the temple, brought up in the temple. And there she's called Miriam, and she's called the sister of Aaron. Now, was this just confusion in the Quran? Or did the Christians in the 6th, 7th century Arabia, from whom this story must have come, still know who Jesus' heavenly mother was? Now, the king was enthroned in the Holy of Holies as the Lord, and at this point, we need some more temple background. The older faith of Israel had known El Elyon, usually translated as God Most High, the aspect of God who Christians would later call God the Father. And he was the father of the guardian angels of the nations, and of these, the Lord was the firstborn, and he was the guardian of Israel, and he became the special God of Israel. So he was the Lord, the Son of God Most High. Now, the text of Deuteronomy 32, that's been found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, differs by two letters, so they're so scribes again, two letters from the one we use today. It says this, When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the nations according to the number of the sons of God, and the Lord was allocated his people. The current Hebrew text is different and says the nations were divided up according to the number of the sons of Israel, which makes absolutely no sense. So this is the work of those correcting scribes and the changes were made later than the old Greek translation. So almost towards the time of the origin of Christianity, the old Greek translation, the Septuagint, has at this point the angels of God, sons of God. So until about 200 BC, the other text was known. Now, the distinction between God Most High and the Lord is usually overlooked when reading the Old Testament. But the early Christians were careful to distinguish between the two. Justin, Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, all writing in the second century, said that the one who appeared in the Old Testament was not God Most High, so not God the Father, but the Lord. When Gabriel spoke to Mary, the Annunciation, the distinction is clear. He will be great and will be called Son of God Most High. So Luke's Gospel makes this distinction. Jesus was to be the Lord and to be set on the throne of David. Now return to Psalm 110. The king was anointed, born as son of God, set on the throne. The throne itself was a symbol of wisdom. Those who sat on the throne became her children. Ezekiel saw the throne leaving Jerusalem, and she was the living one. Jacob of Sirach, a Syriac-speaking bishop in the early 6th century, wrote a homily on the chariot that Ezekiel saw. And he said that the throne chariot was Mary, and the one enthroned on it was her son. 
Now, without a temporal context, this makes no sense at all. In Egypt, in the pre-Christian period, the throne was represented by the great goddess Isis. She was actually depicted with the throne as her headdress, and the throne shape was the hieroglyph of her name. The throne was called the mother of the pharaoh, and she was shown sitting on her lap. Now, we don't know if there was anything similar in Jerusalem, but Mary did receive the title, the seal of wisdom. And the style of statue known as the seat of wisdom, the Sede Sapientiae, of course, is now the great seal of Walsingham. I was not amused at to see this on the paper napkins in the canteen. <laughs> um, in Psalm 110, the newly born king was proclaimed as Melchizedek, the eternal priest, and this became a title for Jesus. There is a memory of this in the high priestly role, the wisdom's child, in an early Christian text found in Egypt. This is called the teaching of Sylvanus. And it has wisdom speaking to her wayward children about the gifts that she offers them. This is what she says. Christ came in order to give you this gift. And I am giving you a high priestly garment that is woven of all wisdom. Return, my son, to your first father, God, and to wisdom, your mother. Wisdom then clothed her high priestly child with a garment of wisdom. Now I return to that enigmatic poem in Proverbs 8 that I mentioned earlier. This poem depicts wisdom beside the creator as the creator works. She was there at the beginning, before the material world was marked out and established. Now the beginning is temple talk for the Holy of Holies, part of the temple that represented day one, the invisible state before the material world. <laughs> so, looking at that diagram, wisdom is represented as being in section one, she's in day one, she's in the Holy of Holies. This is where she gave birth to her son, as John saw in his vision, and that is why Mary, or Mary and her child, are often depicted in the eastern apse of a church which is our equivalent of the Holy of Holies. She's often shown in icons sat in the Holy of Holies where the Holy of Holies is a four-pillared area with a red curtain raised up to reveal who is within. But she had formerly been hidden away behind the veil of the temple. Now, hidden in Hebrew, this is more of this wordplay, is the same word as eternity. Beyond the veil was the hidden state of eternity. And that controversial word in Isaiah chapter 7, the virgin shall conceive, the word virgin, is this word hama, and it literally means the hidden lady. And when Isaiah was translated into Greek by the Jews of Egypt, perhaps in the 2nd century BC, they still knew the identity of the hidden lady, and they translated the word as virgin. Now, this Jewish community had fled to Egypt as refugees some four centuries earlier, when the faith of the first temple had been purged by King Josiah, and the actual temple building was looted and destroyed. But this community in Egypt kept the older faith. And it's not surprising to find that texts about the lady were preserved in Egypt, I'm thinking of the Wisdom of Solomon ben Sirah, new ones were compiled, the Wisdom of Solomon. When the new translations of the Greek script, the Hebrew scriptures were made by Jews after the advent of Christianity, so mid-second century, certain words were changed. And the Hebrew scriptures, when they were put into Greek by the post-Christian Jews, had certain words they simply would not allow. One of them was Christ, and they invented a new word, which was oily, and that was used instead of anointed. And the other one that's most important for us is that they would not use the word virgin. They simply used the word young woman. And of the three post-Christian translations that we have, the post-Christian 
Jewish anti-Christian version say, young woman, that the older Greek translation has virgin. Now, Justin, writing about 150 AD, knew that Jewish scholars, the correcting scribes, had been altering the Hebrew text. And Justin was born and raised not far from that academy in Palestine where this work of correction was done. So he spoke of what he knew. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls preserve a startling piece of evidence for these changes. The great Isaiah scroll has one letter in the virgin prophecy that differs from the present Hebrew text. The present Hebrew says, as the Lord say to King Ahaz, ask a sign from the Lord your God. But the older Hebrew, the pre-Christian Hebrew, has ask a sign from the mother of the Lord your God. Behold, the virgin shall conceive. Now, this was the lady. And all you need to do to remove the mother of the Lord your God from the text is not even changing a complete letter. You just tweak a letter. If you can imagine the English letters, a capital X and a capital Y, to have the mother of the Lord needs the capital X, the Aleph, and to have from the Lord needs the Y, which is the I. That's the only pre-Christian Hebrew we have of Isaiah chapter 7. And it's quite clear, ask a sign of the mother of the Lord your God. <coughs> Interesting. Now, all the texts we've used so far have been tweaked. So what have we found so far? The angels in heaven could have human counterparts on earth, just as Origen said about John the Baptist. That Mary was wisdom, who was with the Creator in the Holy of Holies before the material world was made. She gave birth to her son in the Holy of Holies. The crown prince was anointed with oil from the tree of life, wisdom's tree. And when he sat on the throne as king, he became her son. And the Lord was the son of God most high, just as Gabriel announced to Mary. And he was present in human form in the Davidic king. Now let's return to the story, the very familiar story, of the nativity as told by St. Luke. He used many temple motifs showing that he knew the traditional understanding of the birth stories, and he left signs that his readers would recognize. He probably knew the story as told in the infancy gospel of James. He knew, for example, there were two episodes to the Annunciation. In the first, as he wrote the story, Gabriel simply greets Mary. That was the well. Mary was afraid. Then the angel spoke again. That's when Mary is spinning. And it's only when the early church began to move away from its temple roots that the temple links needed to be spelled out in detail. And that is when the infancy gospel of James was written down. Now, Luke gives four details about the birth. And they all fit in this temple context. First of all, Jesus was Mary's firstborn son. Well, that's obvious. But firstborn was a title. It was already loaded with meaning. It was the title of the king in the Holy of Holies. Then, wrapped in swaddling bands, the traditional translation is, the Greek is actually, she wrapped him round. And this is what wisdom did with her child when she wrapped him in his high priestly vestment. Remember, the high priestly vestment was matter in the temple talk. So she wrapped him round... Then the child was lying in a manger. He mentions this three times. There was no space in the inn. So each of these is temple wordplay. Wisdom brings forth her firstborn. And there is an, uh, an early Christian text called the Letter of the Apostles, which said that at his incarnation, the Lord was robed with wisdom and power. The manger alludes to the opening oracle of Isaiah. The ox knows its owner, and the ass its master's crib, but Israel doesn't know, and my people doesn't understand. Now, Isaiah's Hebrew wordplay is very good. He's the master of this particular genre. So, only two points here. First, the Hebrew word for a crib is almost the same as the old name for Jerusalem. Luke mentioned this three times, so it must have been important. 
So this is wisdom setting her son again in Jerusalem. Second, God's people didn't recognize the Lord because they'd lost the gifts of wisdom, which were knowledge and understanding. And so this familiar picture of the ox and the ass at the crib was implicit in Luke's story and was part of the nativity story from the beginning, even though it's not mentioned in a written text until the 8th century. The earliest pictures of the crib are just the crib and two animals. Now, some more background before we look at the inn, where there was no place or room. By the time of Jesus, place had become a technical term in both Hebrew and Greek, and it meant the place where the word of God or the glory was present. And those who translated scriptures into Greek often left technical terms untranslated. They just imitated the sound of the Hebrew word. Alleluia is the best example. It's a Hebrew word, but it goes into Greek. Now here, the word in is another example. The Greek word, kataluma, usually meaning a guest room, but it sounds very like the word tapaluma, which is the secret place or the holy of holies. There was no place for them in the holy of holies. That's the point of choosing that unusual word. This is the word that is used in various places in the Old Testament to describe the Holy of Holies. So, what was the temple meaning of she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him around, laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn? It meant she gave birth to the firstborn, wrapped him around with a garment of wisdom, set him in Jerusalem because there was no place for the glory of God in the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies was empty, as people liked to point out. It was literally empty. So, what happened such that the lady vanished from the temple? It was rather like the situation of the European Reformation, but in this case, it was the purges of King Josiah. The lady and everything associated with her were banished from the temple. This was remembered as the time when they abandoned wisdom. In the original temple, as we can see from ancient poetry, she had an honoured place. Another of the poems at the end of Deuteronomy, they kind of put things on to fill up the end of the scroll, described how the Lord became king over the twelve tribes at the annual festival of kingship. The Lord came from Sinai, he came from ten thousands of his holy ones, with a flaming fire at his right hand. And you look at that and you think, well, that's a very odd thing to say. This is another rearranged text. If you do a little tweak within the rules, flaming fire becomes the lady's ancient name, Ashratar, the one who gives blessing, the one who gives happiness. So when the Lord came to the temple as king, the lady was at his right hand. The correcting scribes changed her name wherever it occurred in a text. The most common way was to substitute the name of a Canaanite goddess. But when her name is found on an inscription, graffiti, something like that, where there were no correcting scribes, it appears in its original form. So Mary took the baby Jesus to the temple. Christian tradition remembered this event as the lady and her son returning to the temple, the coming of the king and his mother. The Arabic infancy gospel, perhaps from the 6th century, told the story like this. When old Simeon saw him, shining like a pillar of light, and when the lady Mary, his virgin mother, was rejoicing over him and carrying him in her arms, the angels praising him stood around him in a circle, like guards standing around a king. This is the king with his holy ones and the lady returning to the temple. And if you look at the titles, for example, in the great Akathist hymn, which you'll be um, singing later this week, you will find, you can go through and you can pick out perhaps 20 titles of Mary in that hymn that come from just this one sample of Marian traditions. And in fact, you can source all the titles in that great hymn in the great Miriam wisdom Mary traditions, 
of the pre-Christian state of the Hebrew Scriptures. Now, what I've told you today is a little tiny bit. Uh, you know, when you tear a piece of fabric from another, you're left with lots of hanging threads. It would take me a very long time to show you all the fabric that had been torn from. But I heard last week, and I hope it's not true, but I heard last week that the new Catholic version, of the, the Catholic version of the Old Testament, has decided to drop virgin from Isaiah 7 and put young woman in. Now that is sheer ignorance. Apart from anything else, it's sheer ignorance. The Catholic Church could do it. I am just stupefied. I hope what I've seen and heard is wrong. Well, there we are, friends. What a, what a mind-blowing journey. Um, we really are um, going soon to coffee uh, and then making our way to the uh, Catholic shrine, uh, but we will just allow one or two moments in case somebody has such a burning question or point that they can't bear to contain themselves, or that we might be enlightened, or that you might be enlightened, by any point you'd like to make. Any question? Yes. Can I just say that it seems that the, 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 the Almighty has decided to give scholars a great deal to do by creating a written Hebrew which doesn't put its vowels in, which means that every, every, you know, every word that comes has possibly two or more Oh yes, and in fact, there's a, um, a Torah scroll in the synagogue. It's never pointed, never had its vowels in it. And if you say why, ah, the letters mean one thing on earth, but they may mean something different in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> so they acknowledge that they never got it wrong. Are you familiar with the work of the Greek atheist lady lecturer who's filled in the Radio Times as giving a televised broadcast this week of the hidden life of God in the Hebrew Do I know Francesca? Yes, she was on the no, she's going to be on the telly next Tuesday. How does show work relate to you? Um, exactly opposite. <laughs> I, know, I know her very well. Um, and what she is suggesting is not new. This has been in the journals since the early 70s. Um, the establishment tried to hush up the fact that some um, broken, well, great big pots, P3, were, had been found in a broken state, they reassembled. And they have got, there's this place, it's a pilgrim way station down in the Negev, and they've got um, inscriptions in the old Paleo Hebrew um, of. Yahweh and Ashrata, the old name, giving blessings to people. Uh, it's very, very interesting. Now, the establishment for a long time thought this was not a good idea for the Sunday school to know about this, so nothing was said for a very long time. Um, but it was there in the journals. Now, the, the picture that they presented is that the Lord and Ashrata are a couple. Where I disagree with them profoundly is that what their interpretation does not fit with the rest of the Hebrew Scriptures, where if you read the texts uh, unpointed, um, and sometimes with the words divided differently, because you know they've just, uh, this is a recipe for a headache, it's just a, str it's just a string of consonants. Um, the lady, Ashwata, is the mother of the Lord, she's not the wife. And so I, I absolutely disagree with the establishment, not for the first time, I have to say. Um, <laughs> because they have, you know, this has God got a wife and all the Sunday supplements, so this is a good one. Uh, it's wrong. <coughs> um, and it's this pop presentation of scholarship um, wanting to um, undermine things, mm -hmm. which is what sells newspapers. Yeah. But okay. if you, in fact, <laughs> try to tell a Sunday supplement, you know, we have proof that the Mother of the Lord is an ancient title, is it? Interesting, you know, sell it to the Pope kind of thing. Um, and that's the so, so you will see some interesting things, very interesting things, but it's not it's not congruent with the rest of the evidence of the Hebrew scriptures. And in the Radio Times, quite interestingly, um, Francesca has made a huge PR boo-boo. She's photographed holding an English Bible. 